Uh, human history is basically a list of things that couldn't be done, but then were done. Exactly two years ago, I stood on a similar stage in my hometown of Delft, the Netherlands. There, I presented my idea on how to rid the oceans of plastic. I talked about how, while diving in Greece, I came across more plastic bags than fish. I talked about my high school science project, which I used to study the problem itself and why it's so difficult to clean up. It amazed me that in the middle of the oceans, over a thousand miles offshore, in a place where perhaps no human has ever been, you can find on average six times more plastic than plankton. It amazed me that over a hundred thousand mammals and over a million seabirds each year die because of that same plastic. It absolutely shocked me that entire species are being threatened by it. But what perhaps astounded me even most was that most people involved in the topic were absolutely certain a cleanup would be impossible even though nobody has ever seriously investigated it. It is, of course, essential to first close the tap to prevent any more plastic from reaching the oceans in the first place. But that is not a solution to the plastics already trapped in the middle of the oceans. If feasible, a cleanup technique could greatly reduce the economic, ecological and health impacts in those regions. Besides, the natural loss of plastic from these five concentration areas is likely small, so it hardly goes away by itself. A massive challenge it would be, though. Uh, the name Great Pacific Garbage Patch suggests there would be an island of trash floating in the middle of the oceans. And this image has spurred many cleanup concepts, all of them being based on vessels with nets that would go out and start fishing for plastic. Uh, and e unfortunately, though, even though the concentration within these five subtropical gyres is extremely high compared to the rest of the oceans, it's still spread out over millions of square kilometers. And hence, using such methods, it would likely take many billions of, dollar, billions of dollars and thousands of years to clean up just a single area. Furthermore, bycatch and emissions from ships would likely cancel out the good work. And furthermore, the ocean isn't a particularly friendly place to do things. However, back in high school, I realized there might be an alternative. I wondered why go through the oceans if the oceans can also go through you. Instead of going after the plastics, you could simply wait for the plastic to come to you without requiring any added energy. An array of floating barriers would first catch and then concentrate the debris, enabling a platform to efficiently extract the debris afterwards. The ocean current would pass underneath these barriers, taking all neutrally buoyant sea life with it, preventing bycatch. An elegant idea, if I say so myself. But, um, <laughs> but um, when I attempted to start answering these questions, um, things didn't really go according to plan. Uh, the only budget available at the time was the 200 euros of pocket money I saved up, and uh, there were only a couple of people that offered the help back then. So I, I wasn't prepared to give up though, and uh, then decided to pause both university and social life um, in order to focus all my time on this, realizing that that will be the only way there would be a chance of this project getting off the ground. So I set up a foundation, the Ocean Cleanup, 
Um, but uh, there were these 50 questions that when I started studying aerospace engineering that I compiled with, uh, with a group of professors and industry experts that, well, um, remained unanswered. So, um, yeah, then something peculiar happened and it changed my life. Although the 26th of March 2013 started out like any other day, soon my phone wouldn't stop ringing, the ocean cleanup social media exploded, and for days I received over 1,500 emails per day in my personal mailbox. The story went viral. So we then started a crowdfunding campaign and successfully reached our $80,000 target and using all the offers to help we received that month, we then assembled a team that eventually grew to 100 volunteers and professionals. And see, here you can see part of a team in Delft. So suddenly, I wasn't alone anymore. Um, and during this, uh, this period of about a month, we uh, also received quite a bit of skepticism that fortunately confirmed the questions we set out to answer were the right ones. So now we had the budget and the people to perform an extensive feasibility study. The 50 questions covered the fields of engineering, oceanography, ecology, maritime law, finance, and recycling. It can't be done because the plastic is too deep. So we built this multi-level troll, organized several expeditions to one of those garbage patches, and measured the vertical distribution of plastic. And what we found was that fortunately, most of the plastics can be found in the top one to three meters. So it's actually pretty reachable. It can't be done because of the storms. Well, in this project, the ocean is our greatest friend and indeed our greatest enemy. So um, using computer simulations and scale model tests, we then engineered a new type of floating barrier that can operate in over 95% of conditions. And this, this new and patented uh, floating barrier uh, kind of works like an invented pendulum. Because if this would be the screen, the floating barrier at the surface, you have this tension cable at a depth of about 30 meters that carries the loads. What happens is that now the screen um, can actually follow the rotation of the waves, thereby keeping in one piece even in the most extreme conditions. It can't be done because booms don't work. Well, for the system to work, two basic principles still had to be proven. First of all, the plastic would need, need to be trapped by these floating barriers. And secondly, the plastic would need to travel along the angle barriers. So we simulated the flow around the booms, which showed us it actually works. But even better, uh, we, then build, uh, we then build a 40 meter long proof of concept, uh, deployed that in the Atlantic Ocean near the Azores, confirming the results. It can't be done because it's impossible to anchor something that deep. While working together with world experts in this field, it actually turns out there's not a lot of difference compared to mooring systems at, for example, two and a half kilometers of depth. And because mooring doesn't have to be as precise as with, for example, oil drilling, it turns out we can actually use quite a simple mooring design. It can't be done because it would damage the environment. Well, for this project to be worthwhile, it's of course absolutely essential for the environmental impact to be negligible. 
So even though the plankton would likely be safely taken away by the current, even if all plankton encountering these floating barriers would be damaged, the time it would take to restore the biomass is less than seven seconds in a year. And in terms of fish and mammals, any impact seems unlikely uh, because no nets are used, entanglement is virtually impossible. Finally, the, uh, environment, or the carbon footprint turned out to be equal to only several hundred cars, making that negligible as well. It can't be done because the collected plastics would be useless. So we collected about half a ton of plastic from the Hawaiian shoreline for research, sent that over to a Brazilian university for quality analysis. And first, we've proven that the plastic can be turned into oil, and that it is just as suitable for that process as normal waste plastic. But this is the feasibility study book. And look closer at the report itself, you can actually see that the book's cover has been made from plastic that has circled the oceans for years to decades. It couldn't be done. But based on all the research, we haven't found a single reason why it cannot be done. We can only conclude that it could be done, it's feasible. Using a single 100 kilometer array deployed for 10 years, almost half the great Pacific garbage patch can be cleaned up. And this is it. The largest structure ever deployed in the oceans by two orders of magnitude. On either side of the platform, there's over 50 kilometers of floating barrier. And what you can see here is just two kilometers, just to give you a sense of scale. The plastic traveling along the angled barriers would get increasingly more concentrated. And once arrived here at the center, it will be so dense, you can hardly see the water. And in terms of the platform, our engineers chose for a spa design. A, um, this is a type of platform that's often used in the oil and gas industry. And this autonomous structure is stable, cost effective, and storm resistant. In terms of the uh, extraction equipment, existing technologies turned out to be uh, suitable. A slurry pump coupled to a centrifuge will be able to extract the smallest particles, while a mesh conveyor like this one will be able to scoop out the larger debris. Finally, moving to the top deck, you can see 162 solar panels, which is sufficient to act as the primary power supplier for the equipment. And to do all this, it would cost only about $6 per kilo. That's an estimated 33 times cheaper than conventional methods. And this is in fact so cost effective that by um, selling the estimated 70 million kilos of plastic that will be extracted, it's potentially even possible to cover the costs of the execution. In fact, over 30 companies have already shown interest in buying up the plastics once we got it out of the oceans. And furthermore, uh, three months ago, the United Nations calculated the cost of plastic pollution in the oceans is $13 billion annually. And considering cleaning up a six of that would cost only $40 million, uh, million dollars annually, it's now almost certainly cheaper to clean up than to leave 
in the oceans. But we're not there yet. Until I can look over the bow of a ship and see the awesome sights of the ocean cleanup array around me, I vow to continue with this project. And after successfully finishing the feasibility study, we started making preparations for the second phase, the pilot phase. Through a series of upscale tests, we'll now work towards a large scale and operational pilot in three to four years' time. And simultaneously to releasing the feasibility study report in New York on uh, June 3rd this year, we, uh, started, uh, we started a new crowdfunding campaign with the aim of raising $2 million in 100 days. And 98 days in the campaign, uh, plenty of time left, right? Um, we, uh, we successfully uh, reached our target, now enabling us to get started. In the next year, uh, our engineers will further iterate the designs um, through uh, new expeditions, we'll get rid of the final uncertainties of the plastic pollution problem itself. And I'm confident that the first pilot will be in the ocean in 12 months' time. And I need your help to make the ocean clean up one of those things that couldn't be done and then we're done. Thank you very much. Got some questions. I'm curious about a couple of items. Um, one is you're proposing a 100-kilometer uh, uh, unit. What's the difference between doing one massive unit and doing multiple smaller ones? And then uh, what are the constraints on shipping uh, nearby your systems? Uh, well, let's first answer your, uh, your second question. So 100 kilometers sounds huge. And for a man-made structure floating on the oceans, it is actually pretty big. But um, on the scale of the Pacific Ocean, it's actually you know, you know, pretty much peanuts. Um, uh, first of all, in terms of um, uh, the legal um, implications, uh, because uh, the, the, the UNCLOS has uh, both the freedom of shipping and the freedom to place artificial islands in international waters. Um, so um, as long as uh, it's not placed in uh, known shipping routes, it's uh, very likely uh, not a, a problem. Then um, secondly, there's the practical um, aspect to it, that uh, if you consider the scale of the oceans, the most nearby harbor is San Francisco. It's 1,000 nautical miles uh, from the, the coordinate where we will place this uh, structure. So if a ship would normally uh, want to go directly through this thing, uh, it would now have to deviate 1.6 degrees, which means the travel path eventually will be only 350 meters longer than it would normally do. So um, hence there is no um, economic damage involved for uh, the, the shipping companies that uh, would rarely want to, to pass through that area. Um, and sorry, what was your, your first question again? You're doing one big one as All opposed right, yeah, to, sure. you know, how does it scale? Right. Uh, so um, actually, it's a, it's a lot more efficient to use uh, a, a single large one instead of multiple smaller ones because, uh, of course, there are these general currents in these large areas, but still on the on the, the, the smaller scale, there are things like eddies that influence uh, the currents and make it rather um, uh, turbulent and variable. So uh, if you would use multiple smaller ones, you'd, you'd have a lot, uh, or a, a much larger larger um, uh, efficient, efficiency loss uh, because of that. Uh, so by using a single large structure, um, um, yeah, you, you, this is really manageable. And we, would, we have been able to get this 45% efficiency uh, in 10 years' time. And of course, the 100 kilometer number is pretty much arbitrary. Uh, if you would do 200 kilometers, um, yeah, I think you would get 68%. So uh, the longer you would make it, um, the, the less you would collect per meter. 
because the, the concentration of plastic becomes less the further out you go, and it goes pretty fast. Um, but it's pretty much uh, as scalable as, uh, as the budget enables us uh, to do it. Joan has a question over here. Two of them, as usual. So the first one is, um, I'm picturing everything now, not everything, but a great deal of garbage, and I'm very familiar with the Pacific Garbage Patch, now corralled into this giant ring that you've created, or a square, or whatever you call it. Yep. Um, and now it would be efficient if they were a pickup spot, if they were somewhere for a large ship to come by and grab this stuff. But I didn't hear about that, and so it makes me wonder, how is the garbage to be collected from this place? So the logistical aspect. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, um, we uh, have now designed the SPA platform to have a uh, capacity of 3,000 cubic meters. Uh, this would fill up every 45 days. Um, actually, on the platform, the only pre-processing that is happening is uh, shredding, so that it will be able to be hydraulically pumped in a, in a tanker, because that's the, the most suitable uh, transshipment me method uh, on the high seas. And um, uh, a ship would, uh, yeah, then this tank would go to land and uh, there the further processing would, uh, would take place. Okay, so one more question. Sure. Okay. So I'm familiar with Chris Jordan's incredible work mm. about the albatrosses and the other birds. The that, picture I used. Yeah, is, uh, I saw the credit. Yeah. It's fantastic. So, but the problem is that albatrosses and other birds want to feed their babies with what they see. So they feed their babies the plastic from the Pacific Garbage Patch, among other places, and then the babies clog up with garbage and die, and then end up on atolls where there are thousands and thousands of these yep. carcasses, as you showed. Now the question is, if you've got a great big collection of this garbage, how do you keep albatrosses and other birds from coming and you know, treating it as a food source? Um, well, there are two aspects to it. First, first of all, uh, we are a thousand nautical miles uh, from land, so uh, any um, uh, aerial life is extremely rare. Um, there are, of course, some fish present there, and what would likely happen is that um, some of these would use it as sort of a shelter. But um, yeah, compare it to, I don't know if this is a really appropriate analogy, but um, for example, uh, if if you would, um, well, of course, it's, it's a temporary thing, first of all. So after 10 years, it would be away. And while well, the plastic that does damage can do it multiple times, while well, we would only remove it once. Uh, secondly, it's a bit like moving all fast food restaurants to, let's say, one, one town in the United States. Well, of course, perhaps there would be a bit more fast food con consumed in this one city, but overall in the, the entire United States, I don't know. It's, 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 um, it, it would be it, it would be a bit less. So, um, okay. does it make sense? We'll talk more. Sure. <laughs> Very good solution. Uh, one one thing I liked for you to elaborate on is you, you mentioned that there's the bycatch is nominal, and was there any bycatch in the study? And could you address how the mesh, uh, you know, it looks similar to a gill net and uh, uh, just the risk to marine life if there is or? Um, yeah, so th this was a, a very important question and it has always been the, the largest um, objection towards any cleanup proposal. Uh, so we actually worked with a team of about 25 uh, ecologists. Um, and uh, really, the thing is that we don't use any uh, mesh. It's it's non permeable. Oh, it, yeah, it's non permeable. So, um, so there's not any entanglement that can uh, can take place. Um, so, and actually, on average, because it takes quite a while to get there, because the average current uh, velocity is about 15 centimeters per second. When it goes along it, it's about 40 percent of that. So say seven centimeters per second, three inches per second. Um, so really, if, if so the average distance is 50, uh, well, 25 kilometers between the initial point of contact and the point where it would uh, get collected. So I mean, it's, it's pretty unlikely, especially since it's under the constant influence of this downward current, that any um, 
any fish uh, would actively uh, try to swim against the current to stay underneath that place for, I think, about four, four days. So, um, because that's the time it would take before actually getting to the, to the platform um, on average. So, and then secondly, of course, there is this whole lot of uh, plankton, uh, which is a, also very important because it's at the base of the food chain. And basically, plankton comes from the Greek word, word planktos, which means to wander. So the definition of plankton is that it cannot, uh, it cannot counteract the current. It just goes along with it. So hence, um, we we cannot yeah we can we cannot uh, catch it and actually we uh, we have repeated this experiment we've done on the Azores and we uh, in the Rotterdam harbor um, we took plankton measurements with a uh, with a net uh, and uh, there was no increase of plankton whatsoever in front of it in compared to a uh, random location uh, so um, we we don't do not expect this to be a problem. Last question. The fundamental principle of separation here seems to be about buoyancy. There's right. marine life being neutral and, and the plastic being positively buoyant. But I'm a bit concerned about the positively buoyant aspects of marine life and in the open ocean, thinking specifically about the entire sargassum community that floats around in these exact same places as, right. the, as the garbage for the exact same reason. Uh, and so for all of the things that are positively buoyant, how do you discriminate, or how does the system discriminate between pulling up plastic and pulling up the sargassum that forms the habitat for so many of the species and is essentially the nursery for the open pelagic system. Yeah, the sargassum gave me quite a bit of headaches at first, um, but then um, it turns out really these, uh, these sargassum ecosystems only exist in the North Atlantic uh, gyre, and considering um, the concentration of plastic in the North Atlantic is 10 times lower compared to the uh, North Pacific gyre. Uh, we pretty much focused all our research on just uh, the North Pacific gyre on this one coordinate, 30 degrees north, 138 west. Um, and and it, it really makes sense to focus on just the North Pacific gyre it's because it's uh, a lot more efficient to do because actually a third, uh, there has been a recent study also published in June, uh, that a third of all plastics of all oceans combined, including close, close off seas like the Mediterranean, a third of that can be found in this single region uh, in the North Pacific gyre. So uh, hence we're really focusing on that area. Thank you, Boyla. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks.